So uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Alice. I am a part of the CA team for the upcoming Netherlands uh, WSDC 2022. And this is basically a fireside chat, chat uh, where we have more experienced coaches uh, to kind of have a talk with new nations coaches about uh, what are some best practice, uh, some uh, to give some specific advice. So I would like to firstly introduce you to the coaches that we have here. We have Sharmila that coached the first ever team Philippines to make it to the WSDC semifinal and also coached team Palestine. We have Druva that coached the world champion team India. Scott Rawson, who coached team Scotland and team uh, UAE, was a CA of WSDC 20, uh, 2019 and is currently a WSDC board member. And Piwi uh, that coached team Hong Kong uh, has also significant experience uh, with teams uh, South Africa and China and is also uh, WSDC board member. So uh, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for making it today. And just uh, for kind of kicking off the conversation, we are now two weeks away from WSDC. So I'm very interested to know uh, what were you up to with your teams at this point. So uh, Druva, you want to kick off the conversation? Yeah, I'm happy to kick off. So I think um, probably the most realistic answer is in an absolute state of panic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the competition is when it feels like everything is coming to a head. The prepared motions are out, and sides are out at least for um, some some of the the um, WZCs, and and so that means you are trying to get the cases in order for that simultaneously. I think two weeks before the competition is when um, the relative strengths and weaknesses of the team become really apparent, and and you realize. Um, how much there is to to fix before the competition. So I think the first thing to say is that being sort of overwhelmed and and pulled in many different directions is is absolutely normal um, at at this point. And I'd say the the two biggest things to focus on are getting the prepared cases right, especially for the first two rounds. You can yeah. of course put a bit of time for the, the the third and fourth rounds, but at least for the first two ensuring that you have a well-written out case um, for the, the um, first and second speakers and that the team feels comfortable on that. And the second thing is in the time that you've got, you probably can't work on everything. So to identify the top three or four things that you want to work on with the team. And similarly for each speaker, um, the top two or three things that you want them to work on and letting them know what those are and, and um, asking them to record their progress on a daily basis so that um, you can measure that and see whether or not they're getting closer to, to the goal. So that's what I'd say. Work on the prepared cases, identify the biggest things that you need to work to improve and, and communicate that with the team uh, and track that as you get closer to the start of the competition um, and then take a deep breath and, and dive in. Cool. Thank you so much. I think this is uh, very important. Does anyone else want to jump in uh, with a sense of uh, what you were doing? Are there similar experiences? Good. I, I'll also add what I think we should have done in hindsight. So things you realize later on as a coach, right? Um, so like Druva, the focus was really on the prepared debates. Uh, what I wish I could have done more with my kids at that point was to take them aside and say, we're obviously preparing this and we're practicing this many versions of this debate and we're doing both sides, but do remember that the debate you might encounter might not be exactly like this. So you need some distance from the prepared motions also and tell them, look, you, you need to respond to the debate that's happening in front of you. So I wish I had done a bit more priming of that. The next thing I wish I had done, which I did not realize I would be saying is maybe I should have let them rest a little bit <laughs> because the tournament is intense and they might run out of gas during the actual tournament. Um, but obviously they need to know that this is a week of, these two weeks will involve a lot of hard work, right? This is not a holiday, this is a competition, but perhaps to be more careful about not wasting time, you know, not just sitting around and starting late and then ending late for no good reason. So being more careful with how I use their time and my own time too. So as a coach, when the tournament starts, your life is on hold. You're in a bubble. So these two weeks, yeah. you might be trying to get some life admin stuff out of the way. You kind of need to be a bit more disciplined about that. Two other things. One, 
setting spars at this point, ideally you would have scheduled them earlier already. And I think you need to be strategic about the kind of spars you set, right? You want your, your kids to be exposed to a wide range of themes. So across um, skill levels, but also across like geographical categories and things like that. So you wanna have that representation in, your, in the spars you set. And then finally, this is when the interpersonal issues in the teams sometimes come to a fore because the kids are like super stressed. They're feeling the pressure. So having to do some, emo so as a coach, you need to pick up on that and you need to do some emotional management at this point. So kids blaming each other, no, no. You have to train them that if, if one of them doesn't do a good job, that's a team failure and not that person's fault. And then you also have to own some of the decisions, right? So if someone isn't doing very well as second speaker, it's kind of your fault also for putting them there. So you don't want the kids blaming each other. Um, so a lot of those emotional conversations need to be done at this point, I think also, if not earlier. Yeah, and I think a big question that we got from coaches uh, is totally related to that. That is how you keep uh, the team motivated at this style. I, I think a lot of them might be very nervous. So, uh, Scott, do you want to share something, what you did with your teams? Um, yes, yeah, so with the teams, um, it would just be trying to be like, no, you're not idiots. Yeah, that's a result that's not gone well actually, you know, what things have gotten a lot more up-tempo um, when it comes to how different countries are operating. Um, it was just trying to be nice to the kids, to be honest, was the main thing. It was like, yeah, you've got really good arguments, but yeah, you maybe lost arguments. Like, that's, that's what happens, and that's the nature of debate. Um, I mean, going back to... Um, what Sharms and Drupal were saying earlier was that sometimes, um, so I remember when we had a particular motion uh, when it came to like, so when it came to preparing the kids for a debate, we had a particular motion, which was, um, is like, this has believes that um, you shouldn't purchase art from war criminals or something like that. And I, was with my co coach being like, oh my God, I bet they're going to try and ban it. I can just see them trying to ban it. Um, and her being like, oh no, of course they won't do that. Of course they won't. Um, and uh, well, one, one of the speakers who wasn't speaking sat down and was like, oh, we came up with this really good idea about banning it. And I was like, it if the CAs wanted you to ban something, what word do you think they might put into the motion? Is that ban? It's like, mm, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, luckily it worked out fine because they debated the debate. But one of the things I would always say to kids is look at the words in the motion. Why, is, why, why are these words being used? Because the, the people who've been setting this motion have thought about this for a reason. Like, look at the words, use the words. Like, um, yeah, but to keep them motivated, just be nice and supportive and be like, when they're bad, be like, well, that was rubbish for these reasons. But you know what? When it's good, it's being like, yeah, you're brilliant for these reasons. Um, so ultimately, that's, yeah. Cool. Piri, you want to jump in? Yes. Um, one thing that's helped me over the years as well um, with keeping motivation levels high for the team um, and also anchoring them is in the earlier parts of the training program. So depending when your team was selected, some teams are selected, you know, even as long as a year before WSDC. But in the earlier parts, um, when you are meeting your team um, and doing your introductions, you normally start picking up certain like certain things about the teams um, or, or rather things about the members of the team from which you can develop a theme around. So one of the examples I used um, with a very young team that wasn't really sure of itself when they were going to compete in quite a competitive tournament. Um, I realized that they're very sort of like worried and they're very sort of like um, scared of participating they almost like second guess themselves all, all the time which happens a bit more with younger kids when they're competing with older kids um, but because I knew their potential um, because I'd seen them debate before 
um, outside of the actual team environment. Um, over time, I started getting a theme for them, which was like, don't um, touch the magic, like just let it be, just like, just, just go for, like, just, just run with what we believe and we believe we want to be good. Just forget about everything else. Um, and that theme helped sustain um, them through sort of like the tournament as well, because that theme just kept it through, like, this is what we're going to do. Like, this is, we're going to be continuing to do this and we're going to be fine. And everything else is just noise. Obviously, you, you will change the theme, whatever, um, in whatever way is necessary. Um, with whatever team you're working with. Another example outside of debate um, is, you know, 1998 Chicago Bulls team. Um, and it's literally the name of the, um, what you call this, of Michael Jordan's documentary. It was literally called The Last Dance. And it was like, this is the last time we're doing this. We better damn well win this thing. So I think those kinds of themes um, based on the kind of space the team is in and where the team wants to go, those themes tend to anchor the motivation because motivation levels are always gonna fluctuate when you're working with a team, especially because debating is actually quite an adversarial challenging thing. But when you have a theme that can anchor that motivation level, it's easy to draw them back to it. And it also, it also, it also just helps you to just sort of like keep your own sanity um, when teams just like bomb out of tournaments and like um, just, say things that they're not supposed to because they will make mistakes. It just keeps you anchored as well. So um, that has helped me quite a bit. So just themes to anchor that motivation. I think that's an interesting point for you because um, one thing I always am nervous about with teams, especially if they're younger or newer teams, is what sort of expectations to set for them. You don't want to tell a team, you know what, we're going to try and win this competition when in reality, they're not at the level that, that they can do that and don't really create that kind of pressure. But at the same time, I know from having been a student uh, uh, in the competition that having a coach who believes in you and is willing to set higher expectations can be really powerful in making you believe that you're capable of more and, and getting you to push yourself. So it's a, it's a tricky balance to set. And the second thing that further complicates it is that different students and different teams might have different attitudes in the sense that there are some students who are cocky and arrogant and, and think too highly of themselves. And there are others who are nervous and, and worried and um, uh, uh, don't, don't back themselves enough. And, and often one team can have a combination of both kinds of people or the same person can be that at different points in time. So both of those make things complicated. And so what I would encourage, and, and I think what we try to do is to be very clear that we are shooting for something meaningful and setting that expectation probably slightly higher than what we think is sort of quote unquote realistic. So if you are a very new team, then saying, you know what, we're going for the break. We are going to fight to be in the break with um, the, the competitive teams. Um, if you're a team that you think can uh, pretty pretty easily break and 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 you want to shoot for it. You want to say we're shooting for semis and beyond. So setting the aspiration, but then once you have set that, one of my favorite lines is um, there is only one debate, and that is the next debate. So once you've set that overall aspiration to think to sort of set the tone for overall training, once they're in it and and sort of doing the rounds, making sure that they're not sort of stressing out about, you know, will this loss mean that we're further or closer to the break, but rather just saying, okay, what you're focusing on is winning the next debate. And finally, if you need to having individual conversations with individual members of the team uh, to give them the kind of motivation that they need, whether that is to um, be more realistic or to, to pump them up a little. Yeah, and I feel like every team is very unique. So you really got to take the time to get to know them and how they uh, react to things. But I think uh, one very interesting thing that we might uh, want to discuss is how is the process of coaching a team different when it's a new team versus when it's a very experienced team? So uh, does anyone want to jump in on that? Here we go ahead. I'll, I'll go after a few. Okay. Um, let me start off by 
I'm speaking about a fairly new team because I think that's going to be most relevant um, to this chat. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase what Druva mentioned there, which is with a fairly new team, it is your responsibility as a coach to, to set up the belief system. Um, and you have to actually live it um, because children are surprisingly good at picking up and acting on your energy. And if deep down you have doubts, um, they're going to sniff it longer before you do. So it is your duty first and foremost, especially to a new team, to believe in them at a base level of being able to get better at debate, regardless of, you know, how far they can go to the tournament. And I think when you can frame that, and that is true, the kids are going to pick up on that sort of like authentic sense of belief you have in them. And through that, they will speak in a way that is generally free of insecurities. And importantly, they're going to be more comfortable to make the kinds of mistakes they're going to learn from. So one of the things we used to do a lot back in the day um, when I, we, we used to coach, um, we used to try amalgamate in South Africa, their entire sort of like coaching setup. So we would coach the South Africa junior team and would coach the two South Africa reserve teams and would coach the South Africa main WSTC team all at once, all in one sort of like school and environment. And part of the reason to do that was to help with the journey, especially with the younger junior teams. And I did a lot of work with the younger junior teams at that time. And one of the things I learned for them was Luke always used to insist that this is a free environment to make mistakes, but we believed in them so much and they had no doubt that we believed in them because they would within that environment be competing, making mistakes against better teams, but their growth would be accelerated so much, even though they're far less experienced um, specifically because we set up a system that could validate their belief and we actually lived it. And it's, 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 it's all good and well to tell kids you believe in them, um, but it's, it's a completely different difference you make in the psyche of competitive debate if you constantly put them in environments that validates that you believe in them and them carrying that sort of like self-belief that has been proven through repeated action is going to help them continue to grow because there's still a lot of learning that's going to happen in that tournament and there's a growth spurt that's still going to happen like in round three four five and them having that advantage of like just real self-belief um bodes really well for them so that's just like one of the biggest tools we've had um for really really young teams going up and i think Others can speak with uh, about the other end of the more experienced teams. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything that PUA has just said. Um, and one of the things that I think is also useful is like in the prep room, in particular, when you've it for uh, on prep motions where you've got an error, is putting belief in the kids that actually they can change positions um, or change the speaking order when they think that that's the correct decision. Um, like if, well, I mean, ultimately, like a lot of people might disagree with me on this, um, but it's, I've been on a team where you just know more stuff than the other person does on a particular issue that you've been launched at. Um, and also you've had kids who just know more about the particular thing that's happening. So you might have been like, on the, in this unprep motion, I'm having these three people speaking. Sometimes it's best to just let the kids in the prep room have that, like make that decision because they can be like, actually, I know more about this. And they're all like, yeah, this would be better as opposed to having them all doing the same thing. And I, I, like, this is what I decided when I didn't know what the motion was. Um, actually, it might be better to, if they're in the room, let them make the decision sometimes, uh, would be my thoughts. Yeah. I guess just some quick ones. I, I think if you are uh, coaching a new team, you kind of assume 
that they will probably lose a bunch of rounds and possibly even early in the round, early in the tournament, right? And so you kind of need to know how to manage that. Because to kids, that is that is terrifying. They're going to feel like they failed you. You prep the case so hard and then, you know, you might still lose the round. Um, and so what attitude do you want them to have towards feedback is one, right? Like you don't want to train kids to be blaming judges. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's a bad habit to have. Um, you want them to be able to take feedback in a healthy spirit, uh, both the positive and the negative for comments that judges have about their teams. And then you need to, after listening to the judges, pull them aside and regroup them and be like, okay, you heard about some of the things that you didn't do very well. Now, you know, let's take what we can get from that and let's now move on to the next round. Uh, these are our targets for the next round. And you also need to tailor your feedback to them. So if you're dealing with a very experienced kid, you can have seven points of improvement and you can actually be angry at them for not you know, executing what you agreed on. But if you're dealing with someone who's fairly new, one or two points of improvement should be enough because they won't be able to act on all of that, right? Um, and sometimes it will be the same comment over and over again until they get it and that's okay. And you need to make sure that you reassure them, you know, they're, they're okay, it's not their fault. Um, the other two things I think you, you should do is you probably should go to a prep tournament, at least one or two prep tournaments, ideally not too close to WSDC, um, and use that as an opportunity. So like rewatch their debates and use that as an opportunity to see what, what the kids are doing well, um, and also to determine speaker positions because you won't have much data on them, right? And finally, drills really help in this situation. So don't jump into full debates right away because sometimes that is intimidating and that might not even be productive because if their prep is off, then you've just like yeah. potentially wasted an entire debate, right? So you want to do rebuttal drills, building an argument drills and shorter exercises instead of complete full debates all the time. Cool. And I think still talking about uh, both drills and new debaters, I would like to ask each of the coaches to please share with us uh, one activity that is your favorite to do uh, with new debaters. So uh, does anyone want to start on that? Hmm. <laughs> I'll give you a minute to think. I can I can start because I think with new debaters there's by and far a clear favorite activity for me and that's getting them to watch debate videos especially of teams that are uh, better than them and es especially now in the online world that we live in there are so many excellent rounds especially from 2020 and 2021 um, available online and I think it's um, a real real incredible resource and to um, have students Give the students the motion beforehand, get them to prep it, watch the debate, compare the case that was done to what uh, they had originally planned. Uh, the second is to make take careful notes while watching the debate, including of the kind of language that the teams are using and to try and emulate that language. And by emulate, I mean shamelessly copy that language because that can be a pretty effective tool. And then finally, if you want to take it one step further to put specific students, um, if you need someone to practice a second speech, for example, putting them in the position of second prop or second op, pausing the debate video before that point and getting them to give that speech and then compare the speech given uh, to the original. I think that's one of the things that, that both helps them uh, improve so much and is kind of inspiring as well because it then creates the kind of models where you go, I want to be like that speaker. I want to be able to give speeches like that. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd entirely agree with Drew about, uh, about all of that. Um, what is also really quite good sometimes to do is get them to, uh, like, I might miss it, but um, get them to watch a top half debate um, and then do summary speeches or something like that, which just, you know, is this is part of, you know, what you should be doing. Um, but also, um, getting them to do points of information, getting them to um, sit down and look at what, uh, how you would prep for a particular debate and just giving you a summary of like what their point, like what, how they would spend their preparation time um, and giving them, you know, half an hour, seeing what they come up with and then chatting through what their arguments would be like, I find quite useful. So that's one of the other things I would add on to what Trevor said. 
Um, I have two tools that are similar. Um, the first one is specifically to just get them thinking and speaking about what's happening in the world. Um, and it's very simple. You just split, let's say, the team into two teams of three if you're working with a five-man team plus a reserve or a three and two split. And all you're doing there is just you're saying anyone from any team can just mention what's happening in the world, like something is important. Like someone can mention something that's happening in China that's pretty topical at the moment. And then they'll be awarded for that. And then the next team has an opportunity to add to that or add something new. But what you're doing there is you're just creating a culture and maintaining a culture of keeping abreast with current affairs and also keeping a culture of knowledge and also you helping them continue to speak up. And what you can do, especially with drills and the reason I like them so much and, and thank you for raising them, Shamila, is that you can sort of like piggyback certain things you want um, them to also learn. So you can teach style as well, right? And you can say, if you are speaking, we need you to articulate your words clearer and you'll give your team more points if you articulate it clearer. Or if you make an argument out of the topic you have raised or the topic you are adding, you get additional points. So you can piggyback things. And then there's a version of that, um, that you are still keeping the teams apart in the same way, but you are forcing them to, instead of just thinking about general um, knowledge, you are forcing them to think about specific arguments um, and you are forcing them to think deeply on the spot. And this is also pretty accessible. So let's say you even throw a motion at them and say, let us have a motion on the, uh, let's have a motion on legalizing prostitution. And one of, the, one of the members in the team is going to be in favor or against it. Um, and let's say they are speaking in our position and the other team then is just gonna ask them questions that's gonna challenge them to defend their position. So they're gonna ask them things like, would you allow someone to play rugby? Because it's the same principle when you are using your body for money. Would you allow someone to work in a mine? Because it's the same principle. And what you're doing is you are forcing the other team to try force an inconsistency from that speaker, but it's happening all instantaneously. And you are using simple motions, but forcing them to think at a quick period of time about ways to defend um, what they are standing for. And what this often also helps with is, you know, the thick quink, uh, the thick quinking, sorry, the quick thinking in sort of like responding to POIs, but also it helps build that intuition of defending arguments that often very experienced debaters have and very new debaters tend to lack um, because of just like lack of practice. And what you're doing with this draw is you are trying to just um, emphasize that. So I think those rules have been pretty effective at different times and they work pretty well. Um, and I think just as a recommendation and a suggestion for other uh, coaches, we could sort of like just write the drills down um, and sort of like have them compile them, have to sort of like just write the basic steps, it won't take a long time. It's gonna be like a page with both of the tools written down and described so that they, they can actually be collated and used. Um, yeah, so those are the two things for uh, our two drills that are quite useful for new teams, even with like very experienced teams, because you can always just like heighten the expectation of quality um, if you are working with more experienced kids. I will suggest a style drill, <laughs> ironic for me, but what I do is I make them, you know, watch videos of, of their speeches or even just audios, right? And then ask them at that point how they might have improved uh, stylistically. So I will ask, where would you have slowed down? What would you have emphasized? Can you think of a better example or any example to use in this part that would have really been very compelling, that would have generated the kind of emotion that you're going for here, right? What would be a good time in the speech to take a POI? Um, and so where, where would it have been nice to, you know, vary your pace and things like that? Um, what would you change the, the words you've used, for example, um, for this particular section? And it actually really helps them to become quite mm. reflective uh, and more conscious of these things for, for later rounds. Yeah, yeah, something just to add on to what Sean just said is like, 
that's absolutely something I used to get my kids to do is um, also not just watch videos of themselves, but judge um, judge debates of um, other people and then give me the reasons why it was they awarded points in the way that they did, um, because I thought that was quite useful. And before uh, the, the workshop, uh, we had the coaches to fill a form uh, with a sense of what they are missing and things like that. And one common team that showed that uh, was uh, some of them are having difficulties teaching teams uh, analysis and how to uh, substantiate arguments. Do you have any drills or ideas on how to teach that? Well, that's so, a difficult one, isn't it? <laughs> like, it's just asking why. Yeah. Why is that true? And why is that important? So it's just why, why, why? Why is that true? And why does that matter? Why is this relevant? And why is that linked to what we're actually talking about? I don't know if everyone's got something better to say to that. Yep. Yeah. So... I, I'm not one for, especially when it comes to analysis, um, because I, I, there is a specific sort of like structure you can give them, but I think the, the, the best form of encouragement uh, you, you can sort of like give them when you're trying to teach them to make analysis properly is to have them treat the argument as though they are trying to persuade someone. And I think people forget that you're trying to be convincing but in this instance convincing with reasons so what reasons will particularly make someone believe this to be true um and often what at least when you are still learning to speak and improve a structure that can help sort of like give you the right reasons to provide is a simple sort of like a r e i structure um which is give the assertion so I'm just going to use a motion we used earlier um, about um, decriminalizing prosecution. So assertion, um, prosecution when it criminalizes results in worse harms um, for women. Uh, the reason for this is that you are not less likely to seek for protection um, if you have had an encounter with someone who was violent with you, um, and then the next bit is example in the, in, in the sort of like acronym. The example for this is 46% of X or this specific anecdotal example that it gave us that. And then the impact of this, and that's when you're going to say, this is specifically important because if we prove that we protect women more with this policy, it matters less than about um, you know, if we prove you protecting women more by decriminalization, all of the arguments about the risk of prosecution can't stand because we're achieving that more. So the point of this structure is to just give them the boxes they must fill. But what's key in teaching them analysis, I would argue, is for them to understand the patterns um, that flow within, like understanding the thinking behind that AREI formula, so that they can think of arguments that may not necessarily fit into that framework, but because they understand why people must know an impact, why people must have a specific example, and why people um, must, must give reasoning um, after giving an assertion. And once they understand why those things must happen, then it's gonna be easier to sort of like adapt arguments outside of that ARE I formula. Very quick one. This is an adaptation of what Druva said earlier, actually, because I, I also do a lot of that, which is make them watch a portion of a really good speech and then ask them to break down that really good speech. So you, you go, mm -hmm. what was the claim in this speech? What evidence was provided for the claim? What specific mm -hmm. analytical links were provided? Which ones did you find most persuasive and why? Which ones do you think need a bit more work? How might you make it better? Obviously, sometimes they can't answer that until you help them with it. But seeing it happen for other people kind of helps them then adapt it. Mm -hmm. I, I think, Shams, another version of that could just be watch that speech 
now deliver that argument. So that's like one level before them having to sort of understand what's mm -hmm. happening well and what's not happening well is just try to say the same reasons back and and often that in of itself helps you understand what they've understood and not understood in that when they just mangle, just repeating what somebody has just said um, and learning to just practice giving those arguments can also mean that the next time they're in a similar debate, they can just pick it up and, and use that same one. And then the next step, I think, is is what Sham said, which is really useful, which is thinking critically about that argument and how you can make it better and why they're doing things that they do. And I think one other common thing for every coach is a prepared rounds. So I would like to hear from you, uh, from each of you, one actionable tip on prepared rounds. Uh, so interestingly, it's almost like seems counterintuitive, but one of the reasons teams win prepared rounds is because of being as responsive as possible. Because what often happens in prepared motions is because teams spend so much time preparing their own case, they are not, they don't have the inclination to be as responsive as they can be because they've been invested in so many layers of analysis and so many hours of preparing that responding to an argument is just not as intuitive as it would have been if you just had an unprepared round. So one of the best bits of advice in prepared rounds is to just make sure you emphasize them having rebuttal and continuing to respond as much as possible. I can add on one other tip, which is um, sort of around examples, because I think with uh, prepared cases, there's the risk of there being too much information. So reading up about everything that you can about the motion, then setting that aside and creating a, a case which is argumentative and strategic. So sort of thinking about what are the main things you want to prove in order to win, and then bringing back in examples as a way to support specific arguments that you're making in the case, rather than having the examples be the case itself. So um, that could be something that's useful. 100%. This one is just an extension of what Duga said, actually. Um, they need to know how to use the information they have, and they need to know how to weaponize the information. Mm -hmm. So what you want is an argument, not facts in search of an argument. So you need to be able to talk them down sometimes and say, this example only matters in this particular context. <laughs> Otherwise, there is no use to bring this up. And also just like one or two very well-chosen examples sometimes, as opposed to like example soup, right? So they need to know the relationship between argument and example here and what is supporting work. Scott, do you have uh, any, any other thoughts on that, on tips for prepared rounds? Scott is on his iPhone 3. It might take a while. <laughs> Can you hear us? <laughs> oh, sorry. What was the question? Uh, if you have any tips for prepared rounds. Oh, um, well, like I said, look at the words. And my main thing would be, why is it that the motions committee are setting this? What are their thoughts? Why is it that they're wanting this debate to happen? And what are their thoughts on it? Because they're clearly thinking there is a thing here. These are the words we've specifically chosen. So what is it that we want to see happen on this side and this side? And that's, for me, the most important thing when it comes to uh, prepared rounds. Um, as well as, well, do your do your best and but don't don't stress out your kids or about it um i remember myself and uh Kalina, who coaches the greek team being up until about 6 a.m one night when i was like oh my god there's oh there's there's actually a they could define it like this um and having a nightmare about um jurisdiction uh when it comes to the european criminal court so it's like, yeah, just 
let them chill, think about the words, and actually it should be all simple if you do it well. Cool. And I think changing a little bit the subject, uh, one common challenge that everyone is facing this WSBC and last year as well is that everything is online right now. So uh, how do you think are the best ways of networking as a judge, as a coach to kind of get those sort of tips uh, when you are in an online environment? To be honest, um, I think just reach out to people. So many other coaches are probably also lonely and probably yeah, also miss having the network, right? I was about so to say they, that. Yeah, they, they'll respond. Send a message and be like, how are you doing? Or I'm a new coach, da da da. I wanted to ask a few questions. Or are you okay with me sending you messages occasionally? And coaches are usually very friendly. The other thing is, I would suggest, and we did this, I think, for... Did we do this for Mexico WSCC, which is also online? I think like coaches just got together online after to hang out if you want to do that, yeah. right? Like, um, which is also an option for coaches and judges. Uh, just reach out. People are friendly. Yeah, especially in the online yeah. space. Like, hey, human contact. Yeah, I mean, mm. ultimately, it is just grim, but mm. like, it's better than nothing. So, like, that's yeah. it. Like, just try and you know, like, I miss you, P. Way. I miss you, Charles. Exactly. exactly. Like, take this is a very good example. Like, I haven't seen so many of my favorite people in the world in four years, even. You know what I'm saying? Like, I am genuinely happy to see Charles, Druva, and Scott. Like, I feel whole. It's like, wow. And, you know, it used to happen once, maybe when I'm lucky, depending on international tournaments, three or four times a year. And I was actually spoiled for that, right? I even forgot, like, just how happy I was. Now it hasn't happened in four years and I'm losing my mind, right? But now I'm genuinely happy. Yeah, so Shams is right. Like, like we have so much time to chat, um, even more so that people are just like craving to share experiences, and you know? So yeah, that's like perfect answer like that. And I think that's true for the students as well, which is when they're waiting for a decision, encourage them to turn their videos on and try and make conversation. It'll be awkward and like pulling teeth not just because they're online, but also because they're teenagers, but uh, mm -hmm. encourage them and push them to do it. Um, and if you need to break the ice by saying, okay, we'll put our videos on, just take a screenshot photo together, then do that. Mm -hmm. Give them, I mean, even in person, we sometimes had to give our kids like conversation prompts they could use, like ask them how school is going, ask them um, what the weather is like, and just encourage them to try and build that, conversation and communication with other teams because it's one of the most magical things about WCC and um, uh, it's it's something that that would be useful uh, for them to be able to do and and if you as a coach are feeling nervous uh, and, and don't want to reach out directly then please feel free to also reach out to the board in the cap they're usually very um, supportive and and are, are very helpful and, and open to um, helping make those connections as well. That's indeed a very important thing. And uh, just to jump in on a final question, I think a lot of that process of coaching uh, is also happening online. So how do you kind of create this learning environment before the tournament uh, online with the kids? Uh, if anyone has any thoughts on that, that would be great. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention this because I'm, I'm, I'm sort of like guilty of not doing it at times. Um, largely because I like being around people, but energy, 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 energy. Um, you have to keep the energy levels high. And I'm saying this because I'm guilty at times with some of the coaching that's sort of like, without even realizing, it just becomes boring because you, you're staring in front of a computer screen and you don't, you, you, you just like, you, you can't, it, it almost feels like you can't unpack yourself with the same amount of passion because you're lacking that human interaction. Um, and so without realizing oftentimes your energy sort of like drops when you're doing online learning um, environment. So just keep aware of energy, even if at times you have to superficially lift your energy, um, rather do that um, so that you can maintain a higher level of energy in the environment. Um, cameras on um, by all means necessary. And um, once again, I'm, I'm speaking about a hard lesson as well. So I'm not speaking as a guru, I'm literally speaking of someone who learned the hard way. Um, 
Yes, and I am like in South Africa, like our internet is generally terrible, and then we have power cuts, and then it becomes much slower because of that power cut. But as 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 reasonable as possible, and if you can keep cameras on, please do. Um, those are just like the first things I would say up front with online is high energy levels, and then have the cameras on because you're going to keep them more engaged and less likely to be distracted because children are more likely to find something that's going to appear on the internet because notifications would come up on their laptop if they're in that laptop. And it's easy, it's much easier to be disrupted because you are literally in technology and technology is literally designed for your attention. So um, energy has to be high and avoid um, them having their cameras off because they're going to be distracted. Well, two other quick things to keep energy up that we could do as well. Um, one is do some sort of team activity online. So having them all watch the last dance, not the game, but the um, uh, uh, Netflix show or or something else that sort of maybe like a sporty, exciting movie and getting them to talk about it um, could be could be a fun activity. And the second is um, as you do sessions, especially if it ends up lasting longer than an hour and a half or so, um, having sort of a structured in break where you require them to prove to you that they have actually taken a break. So one thing we did, which is very fun, was we said, okay, you have a break. Now you have to go um, find a member of your family in your house and take a photo with them to prove that you've taken a break and then send it to us. And then everyone sent us really cute photos of them with their like aunt or grandmother or mom or whatever. So um, ensuring that ensuring that they're taking breaks or, or saying you have to go take have a snack and, and send us a photo of your snack and then get, like pictures of soggy cereal and it's just cute and fun and, and ensures that they're doing what they're meant to be doing that's so cool yeah that's really awesome uh scott shamila you have uh, any specific tips on that as well well, no, really, because I think Peeway and um, Drove have really summed it up. Like, ultimately, it's just making them feel that they are relaxed, that they've got time to be, you know, if they want to by themselves, that's fantastic. If they want to chill with other people, that's fine. And I think the ideas that they have about, you know, photos of, like, what they're doing, I think that's quite, that's a really good idea. Um, and but also they're like so I've had some kids who are quite uh, introverted and um also like gender neutral as well at times who just want to be uh, be by themselves sometimes because things are a bit too much and other kids from different countries who they're against might be a bit more uh against them then they then then we we probably like um so yeah it is it, it's, it's a balance it's doing those sorts of things which we think are absolutely brilliant and it's also about recognizing when sometimes they need to just be able to be by themselves I just found very quick thing during the actual tournament already they are exposed to so much screen time that you really have to force them to take breaks because it might be a bit intense yeah and i think uh, a good thing for us uh, to close uh, this session might be uh, coaches are under a lot of stress and a lot of pressure too not only the kids so how you yourselves dealt with that? Do you have any tips for people who uh, in two weeks might be going through that? So does anyone want to share? Hey man, look, I just hit the gym. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> I, I, honestly, I honestly just hit the gym. I, I, I don't have any sort of like fancy formula. Um, and also, also, I think there's something that, that's, that's very important that Shamila mentioned earlier, which is sort your life out. Um, like just do your life admin, especially when you'd be going into a tournament environment, just make sure that all the things you need to do are sort of like fixed and ready. And you also have the right support system around that, be it, uh, you know, a partner or a spouse that's also going to just help you, you know, through this, it's going to be an intense, let's say six week period just before WSDC and in the lead up. So um, 
you need to take that responsibility for yourself so that you can set the example of the mental sort of like health space you want your kids to be in. Um, and if gymming is one of your outlets, like it is for me, then yeah, by all means do. Yeah, I mean, like, like Piway's just said, um, I think that's one of the most important things is just making sure that you are in the right space um, when it comes down to like that period where you're building up and doing all of those sorts of things where you have to create cases, where you're looking at some kids, like all of it is intense and it's stressful. Um, but, it, well, and that's difficult now when it comes to online because we don't get to see each other. But when it's actually when you're seeing people, well, we just get to sit and chat, uh, which is one of the best things, which is possible because we get to de-stress after all of it, which is something which hopefully we'll be able to change uh, when it comes to the next couple of years, um, because you can just actually sit there with your friends. Yeah. Um, I think I would say being conscious that you are not a robot is very, very important. Like listening to your own feelings. If your team loses a case, you're going to be sad to them. That's okay. So like uh, recognizing that this dynamic is at play is also very, very important. Because some coaches don't want to admit to themselves that we actually care a lot about this activity and we get angry and we get upset. And, you know, self-awareness really matters. That's one. Second, if you are really angry or frustrated in the moment, I, it, take a moment before you talk to the kids as in like step away and like self-soothe first because you will say things you regret you will give advice that's not healthy right um warn the people in your lives that you will probably be quite difficult in these moments i literally have been like sorry friends i'm not going to be responsive i am going to be ragey i will need i will need your help and support at this time um maybe plan some treats for yourself in advance so like you know, if there's something you really like eating, make sure maybe on day three that you have access to that. In my case, it's probably a glass of wine at the end of the day. You need to be able to unplug from the tournament as well. Like you're like, okay, enough. I'm going to bed and I actually am going to sleep, right? Because you need that. Um, so just those little tricks. Yeah. Also, um, can I just slot in something that I didn't quite, that only came to mind after the question was asked. Um, one way that can really be good, one thing that can really be good for new teams um, is to practice prep um, and to be taught how to prep properly. Um, and often it may have to do with giving them specific roles and prep or specific ideas and guidelines about what to do in prep. Because what an effective prep session does is it then gives them confidence going into a debate that they are going to be able to defend this and fight for this regardless of who they are going to be debating against. And when there is a theme that ties into how they will be prepping as well, it almost like carries and sort of starts applying everything they want to do in the tournament through that sort of like hour long prep. So that's the one advantage of like world schools is that like, you can actually do so much in prep um, to make sure that they are in the best footing because you have a whole hour. Um, and also listening to their preps because that's when you're gonna start learning about the dynamics, about which kinds of arguments uh, come from these kinds of speakers and then you can switch around the responsibilities. And it's also gonna help you find out that you don't know the conflicts that will come up and the personalities and all of those things that are going to be even further exacerbated by tournament. So I'm sorry to just sort of like throw it off board, but I, I found this so important and effective that I, I just had to sort of like bring it up because I forgot to raise it. So please do forgive me to digress slightly, but it really was important. I had to get off my chest. Oh yeah, and there's stuff, I've got stuff about prep I can send along with the stuff I said I'm going to send with rules. Um, just hit me up, hit me up. I've got things, I've got the things. 
Thank you very much. And I would like to thank everyone, especially uh, the coaches for coming and sharing a little bit of the experience, everyone who's watching or might watch this later uh, on YouTube. And I wish you all have a great WSBC and see you in a few weeks. Bye. Um, fantastic. And um, can I just have a chat with uh, Varshini?